If I asked you to get a piece of paper and something to write with and to make a numerical list of all the things that you would be willing to die for, how long is your list? The part of what age? Willing to die for. The part of what age? Willing to die for. How long is your list? What is the tribal thing? The part of what age? The tribal self is the goal above the immediate acquaintances of the social Willing to die for. The family, the people you know, the next door, you but the people you know, the tribal self. The part of what age? I'm talking about gold, baby, gold, yes, I'm dead. Right, all power to the people, everybody. So today we're going to get into uh, the discipline of George Jackson. Being that it is uh, Black August, we just want to do something a little different than just simply talk about uh, what you can find on, on the internet all day long about just the uh, the, the basic history of, of Black August and how it got started. But what we wanted to do was, was just kind of emphasize some of the discipline in the and and in, in, in the rigorous regime aspect of George Jackson and what made him powerful, as well as use uh, the black drop of the black gorilla family as a resort of that. And um, if anybody wants a copy of the document, just all you got to do is that I'll be showing on the screen. Just shoot your email in in the chat, and I mentioned that several times throughout the uh, throughout the class. But I do believe it's important that that we always uh, have some documentation to refer back to. So let me share the screen here. And if anybody on is actually affiliated with the Black Gorilla family, by any means, please feel free to jump in and uh, give your input. All right, the discipline of George Jackson and the Black Gorilla family. Quote by George Jackson. I've been in rebellion all my life. So right off the bat, we're getting into the power of George Jackson. But we we do have to start a little bit with some of the uh, basic uh, history aspects. This confirms that y'all can see my screen before I get to just jab along. We can see okay. it. Got it. All right. The Black Gorilla family was a revolutionary. And I notice I emphasize here was. And that simply has to do with the destruction of how, how movements go. And we'll talk a little bit about that. A revolutionary cadre built an organization that aimed to be the prison arm of the Black Panther Party, founded by George Jackson, George Lewis, and W.L. Nolan at San Quentin State Prison in California. The targeted neutralization of the organization came when one of the founding members of W.L. Nolan was killed by a prison guard in January 13, 1970. The second strike came in order to destroy them and attack the core of the organization when uh, uh, George Jackson himself was pinned for killing a prison guard, which ultimately led to him being gunned down and killed in a prison uh, rebellion on August the 21st, 1971. Jackson's death led to inmate protests at multiple prisons. On August 27, prisoners at Antica staged a silent protest over his death. Nobody ate or spoke at breakfast that day. This protest demonstrated the inmates' ability to unite for a common cause and was particularly frightening to the prison's administration, given the fact that in July, a group of inmates known as the Antica Liberation Fraction has sent a list of 27 demands to New York State Corrections Commissioner Russell Oswell. Their manifesto included requests for improving medical care, higher working wages, greater punishment for the guards' brutality, better food, and an end to political, religious, and racial prosecution. The conclusion to the manifesto included the following passage. <laughs> We are firm in our resolve and we demand as human beings the dignity and justice that is due to us by our right of birth. 
We do not know how this present system of brutality and dehumanization and injustice has been allowed to be uh, perpetrated in this day of enlightenment. But we are the living proof of its existence and we cannot allow it to continue. So right off the bat, what you're dealing with here is the fact that what they were highlighting is just how the inhumane treatment and the brutalization of 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 folks that are incarcerated. And what's important about that and, and, and emphasizing and highlighting that in Black August is the fact that too many, too often people look at when folks have done something and gotten themselves in, incarcerated, that you know, you just throw away the key, they get what they deserve, but by by no means is that the is that the right way of looking at incarceration. Especially when you take into account and you look at what happened with George Jackson himself basically ended up doing a one year to life over a seventy dollar uh a seventy dollar rob one year to life you hear me over seventy dollars and so when you talk about something like that that lets you know that the system is is basically to design to to incarcerate and take full advantage and extort to people On August the 21st, 2018, the 47 year anniversary of George Jackson's death, thousands of U.S. prisons launched a national prison strike. They engage in work stoppages, hunger strikes and other forms of protest. The protests last until September the 9th. Which is, again, 47 years after the Antica prison uprising began, like the Antica prisons in 2018, prison strike. Organizers put forth a comprehensive list of demands that expose the oppression inherent in U.S. prison system and laid out a framework to improve their conditions. So what they're attempting to do is is get the proper justification because ex exploitation is is just the nature of the name of the game in terms of what they they do to you in prison as a result of what of what they call legalized free slavery. But then the conditions that the people are under is it does not justify. So each of these historical and contemporary events reveal the truth that black radical tradition has always uh, it has always recognized that there can be no freedom for the masses of black people without white supremacy cap. Uh, why within the white supremacy capitalist system? The fight for liberation is just that a fight. Since its inception in San Quentin, Black August has been an in, 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 indispensable part of that fight. In the current political movement, when some misleaders would have us just bury uh, the radical nature of Black resistance and in, instead prop up reformist politics that glorify celebrities, wealth, and assimilation into the capitalist system, Black August is as important as ever. It connects Black people to our history. And serves as a reminder that our liberation does not lie in the hands of black billionaires, black police officers, the black Democrat Democratic Party officials, those black faces, uh, black faces in high places, simply placing a friendly face on the system that oppresses the masses of black people in the United States and around the world, often distorting symbols of black resistance along the way. Black liberation lies uh, as it always has in the hands of the conscious organized masses within the black August tradition, we say study, train, fight. And in the words of, of George Jackson, discover your humanity and love of revolution. Now the black gorilla family began moving toward this illicit economy as a means of survival after the Aryan Brotherhood and the Mexican Mafia declared war on them in the mid-1970s. When that happened, the founders of the early members actually proposed a split based on ideological concerns that the Black Guerrilla family was moving away from its initial founding as a revolutionary organization. Participation in the illicit economy became a means to the ends. To that end, evidence shows that the organization's original uh, end goal remained at its core post-1974, to free black uh, prisoners and to free all prisons in general from what they saw to be as widespread racist repression of prisoner class that could only be uh, upended 
with cross radical coalition building. If we label the black guerrilla family a violent prison gang with our critical insight, we're not just ignoring the history and the aftermath of August the 21st, 1971, when George Jackson was killed. We're also enabling the rewrite of everything that the prison industrial complex did and allows to be done that creates the conditions where black political organizing became necessary for survival, not only against white supremacist prisons, but also against correctional officers as well. Keep at the forefront of consciousness. The collective effort to systematically destroy black militant prisons, both at the formal level and through extra legal means. If an uh, uh, official distortion of the truth is successful, as facilitated with the health of criminology, criminal justice scholarship, it also uh, it, it allows uh, officials to frame political mobilization as terror without any awareness as to how we arrive at this point. Note the erection of Cop City. This is real important because we're seeing how this is moving and, and being done right before our eyes and not too many people are being a part of trying to stop this. Then the state can justify the implementation of incredibly repressive policies such as security threat group classifications and isolation schemes that are long lasting and disproportionately used against people of color. The CIA and the FBI made a direct policy to destroy black liberation movements and employed the Aryan Brotherhood, uh, forms of the mafia, MS-13 and other street tribes organizations to target and neutralize the threats of black militancy. The same fate took shape with the Bloods and Crips. And so what we have to realize is that things didn't start off this way. It goes even to say how when people look at the destruction of what happened with the Black Panther Party in, in, in the late 60s and the early 70s due to certain forms of, of, of attack that were basically just illegal, just, but the, the government was just, felt they was justified in targeting the Black Panther Party, which at the, at the same time you had the Black Liberation Army doing counter strikes. But when an organization is forced to go underground, an organization is forced to operate through a different means, then it, 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 it uh, transforms into something that it wasn't initially set up to be. And what we have to realize, anybody that knows any basic premise of what the CIA's goal is, is to destabilize anything that considers to be a threat to the status quo of the United States. And often, often people think that that only means uh, on foreign soil, but no, it is also domestic operations that take place. And that typically is carried out here now through joint terrorism, uh, the Joint Terrorist Task Force. As we build on an initial discipline of George Jackson, let's keep into, in, the, in context the level of dedication it originally stood for and know that it still remains in the best interest of imperialism. The legacy of the Black Panther or the Black Power and Black Panther remain isolated from the support of the community. So what we're saying is the goal is to continue to make us uh, uh, cats that are doing the liberation work, cats that are out in the community attempting to raise the conscience of the people and, and, and trying to change the dynamic to keep us isolated or dealt with in terms of misinformation by the eyes of the, of the people and the, and the public. By doing so, it makes it that much harder for you to carry out the work. In riddle and mystery lies in the evolution of self-determination. It stands to reason we must look to restore accountability and true value required to build our movement to functional operations on both sides of the fence. Has anybody got anything they want to add or, or question or comment? Not at this point. All right. Now, part of the doc, the information that I got wrote out is from what was known as the uh, BGF Black Book. And the BGF Black Book was, was developed um, a, a, a little while after uh, George Jackson was killed. But these are some of the basic principles and in, in information that was taught to the Black guerrilla family. So I just took certain abstracts out of that. So these are some of the things 
that, that, that they talked about. And again, if anybody wants to copy this document, just put your email address in the chat and I'll make sure after the class uh, between the day and tomorrow, I get that out to you. The three conditions that destroy the black community. So these are the things that, that are taught to uh, black really family members in order to make sure that they, they, they understand what's going on. Poverty, ignorance, and oppression. That trifactor is explained and expressed to all of the membership so that they know what they're what what they stand for. These are the basic elements that bring uh, bring a, the black community to its most unproductive stare. To fight these conditions, we must understand each function in its rare essence, or shall we say, its genesis. There have been many organizations formed to attack each of these three conditions and the offensive must be simultaneously deployed within the Black Panther Party. We also say the same thing, because what you have to realize is that as long as the people are, st are stagnant and as long as the people are not unified in our responses, then what tends to happen is although you may make headway or waves in one part of the city or, or one one area if we're not all on the same page and we're not all moving toward the same goal then it's going to be viewed or it's easy to be viewed or quelled or, or or conditioned down in terms of us being able to make what we call foundational advancement so ignorance is deeply ingrained in our culture we have been robbed of our culture history most of the people don't know about the atrocities that have overwhelmed the black community like lynching, burnings, and rapes that have placed deep scars on people physically, mentally, and emotionally. Our aim is to stop the death cycle of the enemy culture and replace it with our own revolutionary culture. Comrade George Jackson, another quote from him. A reactionary is one who consistently acts without cause, purpose, agenda, plan, intention, or a thought of completing a cycle. This individual has an impulse disorder and lacks the ability to utilize any of the five types of thinkers, which is referred to as analysts, idealists, realists, uh, propagandists, and synthesis. The characteristics of a, revol of a reactionary are impulsive, thoughtless, visionless, and directionless. As leaders of the people, we must be able to set examples that the people will follow. A reactionary will only lead the people down the wrong path. If you don't change the way you think, you will never be able to change the way you act. Now, with that, a revolutionary is one who assists in bringing about a full and complete change of transformation to the people, cause or thought. The changes sought after in most cases, are social, political, economic, and education. The characteristics of revolutionary are visionary, critical thinker, considerate, scientific director, uh, resurrector, and holder of critical consciousness. And this is important because, again, in order to be able to combat and fight levels of oppression, you have to be a visionary. And when you talk about critical thinking, you have to be able to dissect and see things from what they are. We say within the Black Panther Party and the Panther Party is that we have to be able to know the difference between symptoms and problems. Because too often what we do as a people is we address symptoms. And when we address symptoms, that is not putting us on the right path to be able to actually get down to the root cause of problems which is what's necessary to form a real solution. Because if you're only addressing things as it applies to the symptoms, then that's called a suppressant. And if, if, if you're simply dealing with suppressants, which again, when we talk about just basic definitions that are, that are taught to the people, which dumb us down, we refer to drugs or medicine oftentimes when we're really talking about a suppressant. When someone says that they're going to go to the drugstore and get some and get some medicine, 99 percent of the time they're actually getting a suppressant, which is basically meant to mask and hide the symptoms so that your body can do its natural thing and actually fight off the, the, uh, the, the, the virus or the cold or whatever it has. 
but your body naturally fights it off. But what we do in order to feel better, we we suppress the symptoms. Now, that same approach tends to be what, what we are doing from a political standpoint as a people, as it applies to addressing our problems. We simply deal with either suppressants or we deal with something that minimizes the effects of the oppression. And so what we're doing in, in, in either one of those cases is we're doing an injustice to ourselves because when it comes to imperialism, when it comes to oppression or cap capitalism, explo ex ex extortion, exploitation, they are all every, year after year. It's all about getting greater levels of profit, period. And if our quote unquote solutions, which are really us addressing symptoms, are not actually meant to end the cycle, the debt cycle, as, as stated earlier, if we're not ending that cycle, that cycle is simply advancing. And if it's advancing, what they are also doing is advancing the levels of suppressants so that the community will have a higher level of tolerance as they step up their level of oppression. And this is what we keep encountering. So we basically get better at doing what we call coping. And if all we're doing is getting better at coping and that's what we pass on to the next generation, then we're nowhere near being where we need to be to strategically be able to eradicate ourselves of any level of true oppression. So that goes into why it's important to be critical thinkers and to be scientific in our direction. And then we have to be able to resurrect the dead, resurrect the sleeping giant, resurrect the consciousness of our people. And that brings us to the level of what we call critical consciousness. To truly consider oneself part of a revolution, the complete objective has to be the fundamental change of the people's conditions. We must put a stop to all oppression and discontinue with being a part of the problem instead of being a part of the solution. Lead by example. Now, this is the oath of the black gorilla family. If I should ever break my stride or falter at my comrade's side, this oath will kill me. If ever my world should prove untrue, should I betray the chosen, this chosen fruit, this oath will kill me. Should I be slow to take a stand? Should I show fear to any man? This oath will kill me. Should I grow lax in my discipline? Or in time of strife, refuse my hand? This oath will kill me. Long live Comrade George Jackson. Long live the Black Gorilla family. So that oath in itself just speaks to the level of discipline that's going on in the, in, in, the, in the level of expectation that is initially based upon establishing ourselves. So what you have to realize about the black gorilla family, what George Jackson was doing is that people will get basically put in prison and for that matter, don't have nowhere to turn to to better themselves, nowhere to turn to to reflect and see what the conditions are that got pe that got you there, what the conditions are that cause us oftentimes to get, you know, sentences that are way heavier than than what other people may get when they commit crimes, because it's all about dealing with elements of free labor. And it's all about continued continuing the stride of institutional racism. So from that standpoint. The idea here is that you give people something to believe in, something to better themselves in. It's no different than what happened through the transformation with Malcolm X when he went to prison and 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 dealt with the nation of Islam in order to clean them up, clean themselves up and get on the right path. It's the same thing. What we fail to realize is that these type of, 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 of struggles and actions are all around us. It's just that they tend to get suppressed are destroyed by all means, especially if they don't have a religious basis for doing that. Because when you talk about standing uh, completely on, this, on, on, on a political uh, fold and your goal is to change the dynamics of the politics, change the dynamics of, of how the government is operating, how this world is operating, how the people are, and you want to hold yourself and hold the rest of the people accountable for making that change, then it becomes something that needs to be stopped. 
because it, it's going to stand directly in the way of the, the, the path of imperialism as it, as it is right now. And they don't want the next generation to have that, that type of mentality. Keep in mind what a lot of people don't realize is that even when you talk about the Black Panther Party, it wasn't the guns that made the Black Panther Party public enemy number one. It was when they started establishing the um, what, we, what we call the decolonization programs and uh, or what other people refer to as uh, survival programs. When we start establishing those programs and then politicizing the youth, once you the youth are getting their physical nourishment and then they're getting their mental nourishment and their psychological nourishment all at the same time. So from that standpoint, what you're doing is you're becoming a threat because the next generation is being raised to be leaders. The next generation is being raised to be able to know what it means to be self-sufficient and what it means to not be codependent upon a system who's only meant to keep you dumbed down to a certain degree of enlightenment. So when you're raising the consciousness of the people and you're teaching the people that we have to be able to take charge. We have to come up with different alternative ways of addressing our, our, situ our situation, our problems, and we're going to put it back in our own hands and be self-determined. Then that is a, that becomes a threat. And so unlike what may take place to a religious organization, the idea here is that your goal is to impact all people, regardless of, of religion, regardless of race and regardless of specific creed or individual liking likingship. It has to do with the fact that we all say we, we say all power to the people. And so therefore, we realize that the people have to be in a position, in a place to where they recognize oppression for what it is. The, the elite that run the world are a small, small, small percent. And from that, everybody else is in essence a slave. Now, there is obviously a hierarchy to that. But the bottom line is we're all being taken advantage of and all being exploited. And when you get the people to realize that and start being on one accord, going back to what Fred Hampton Sr. was doing, you become a threat. So revolution, revolutionary as a way of life. And this is an abbreviated, um, basically abbreviated description of what we we teach within within the Black Panther Party. Number one, revolutionary is a way of life. The revolutionary should understand that the people are more advanced socially than they are politically. And what's important about that is again. It says overstand here. So for those of y'all who are not familiar with the terminology, we know and recognize the trifactor difference between understand, understand, and overstand something. The masses of our people are simply taught to be able to understand. And to understand basically means that you have an acquaintance with whatever it is that subject matter is. To understand that means that you are able to embody it and actually add to it. To overstand basically means you are able to, like from a visionary standpoint, you are able to create something new from that and you are able to take it and raise it to a higher level. So when we talk about dealing with the consciousness of our people or, or dealing with where our people are psychologically, we recognize that socially they are more advanced than they are politically. This is why, like we stated earlier, people continue to fall for the rat race of of thinking that Democrat, Republican, there's there's in essence a real, real difference between the two parties when you're talking about the same the, a different side of the same coin, the same system. The system itself is is corrupt and destructive. All you're talking about at this point is different types of poisoning. And I know that may seem that may be a hard fact to swallow for some of us, but in essence, we have to we have to realize what's going on. Number two, a revolutionary should understand the difference between education and miseducation and be competent in articulating the kind of education we need to advance ourselves towards independence. 
And so that's super powerful because it's not just any education, because we have to go back to the fact that even the public educational system was basically meant in order to create a worker. And it wasn't because it, uh, the, uh, the, the government basically in the elite basically felt obligated or wanted to do a good deed and see to it that the average person is educated. They wanted to have a, a system because the industrial the industrial age was was on the rise and they needed factory workers. They they needed people to be in a position to be able to go in those factories and work those jobs and keep this car running. And so that's what the, that's what it's about. So we have to know the difference between the types of education and what we're working toward, because if we're not dealing with it from the stance of, of independence, of self self-determination, then when we go to the table and talk about a solution, if I haven't identified what we call define, develop, and then be able to defend what is in the best inter interest of the people, if I'm not on a position of that, then everything that I think that I'm addressing as a, as a solution, we either end up being a symptom or I'm going to be headed down the wrong path in terms of what I'm attempting to raise my people to a higher conscious, consciousness of. Or I may actually in, end up emulating the same oppressive ways that I'm trying to fight to get myself out of. So number three, should overstand that education alone won't free us. Only the application of what we learn to circumstances we are faced with will produce the lives we envision for ourselves. So you have to apply action. You can't simply just be a walking history book or a walking textbook, but you have to put some boots on the ground and do some actual engagement in terms of raising the awareness and, and raising the accountability in, in making things change. Change is not going to simply come because it's the righteous or right thing to do. We have to force that change, just like oppression is forced on us. And force, for that matter, only, only responds to an equal opposite force. Number four, must be willing, able, and ready to give solutions to the problems that plague the people. And it's important that we, we recognize all three of these, willing, able, and ready, because too often, People are simply willing to accept change or willing to to want to see change, but they're not actually able to implement it because they're, they're not they're not studying. They don't have the right education. They don't have the right resources and they're not in the right headspace. They just want, they just are willing because they want something to change. But being able is actually activating or having the necessary components about yourself to be able to engage in revolutionary action. And then when we talk about being ready, that means that you are addressing what we refer to as revolutionary suicide, which basically means that you have to sacrifice the individual and be ready to serve at a higher capacity for the collective. And so to be ready means that you have to put the well-being of the people above the distractions and comfort levels of the individual. Because it is always the individual that gets in the way of the collective as that, it, 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 as that applies to dealing with liberation, especially here in the United States, because we have high access to distractions that basically can cause us to indulge and pull us away from realizing that the United States government is a world bully. And if we keep our head in the sand of the, the, the states of the United States, we may not actually realize that. Number five, must overstand and be able to explain that revolution is a process, not a conclusion. That's real important because when we talk about revolution, again, in going back to being willing, able and ready, a person that's committing himself to, to a higher cause is in it for life. They're dedicating their life to that cause. That goes back to that oath aspect that we talked about earlier, the black gorilla family. Should I ever break my stride or falter at my comrade's side, this oath will kill me. And saying that, I'm basically saying that I'll vow my life for my people. And so when we talk about revolution as a process, 
it basically means that we realize that things are not going to just happen overnight is that we have to commit ourselves to a lifelong struggle of change, which we refer to as revolutionary struggle. Number six must be learned in history, politics, economics, religious history, the Maafa, Willie Lynch, indoctrination, psychology, sociology, science and dialectics. That goes back to being able because it's not a good enough just to be willing, but you have to know what's going on in the world around you in order for me to form a solution. Then I have to be well studied in all of the different areas of what created the problem. It is not simply looking at, at it from the symptom standpoint. In other words, I see that there's police brutality. I want change to happen. I'm going to go out and protest. OK, we can all see the effects of oppression. But when, when we look at police brutality, just from that stand, that basic element standpoint, it is not the actual act of a police officer killing somebody unjustifiably. That is that the root cause of the problem. And so we have to be well studied and learned in all aspects of what's going on in life in order to be able to really dive in and address solutions, holistic solutions. Which is why also we have to realize that revolution is a process and not a conclusion because it is so much to deal with. Number seven should be drug free diet conscious and physically fit. And let me say something first about the diet concept. Too often people equate a diet with basically like you hear people say, I'm going on a diet. Diet actually simply means anything that is taken into or consumed by you, your diet. We also have to realize and be again, overstand that diet is not just physical food. Diet is also what you take into your your all of your sensory inputs. Diet goes into what are you reading? What are you learning? What are you giving your time to your energy to? What are you watching on 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 television? What occupies your time? Because just like having a physical diet, if I'm eating a whole lot of junk food, my physical body is going to break down because it's not going to be able to extract the right nutrients in order to be able to uh, continue to grow the cellular structure. From a mental diet, if I am feeding myself a whole lot of what they call reality TVs, uh, uh, TikTok videos and all kinds of nonsense all day long, I am mentally feeding myself a diet of junk food which means I cannot be able to feed uh, my brain to be able to critically think. I'm not going to be, have, I'm not going to have the right diet to be a critical thinker because I'm not getting the right nutrients for me to be able to dissect the difference between symptoms and problems and be able to come to the table and offer a, a, a part in the play in the correction and in the repair of our people because I am feeding myself junk. Third aspect of that would be the same thing with the with with the uh, spiritual or as well as psychological. So when we talk about diets, people, we need to be aware of the fact that holistically our approach to when we talk about the discipline, because that's that's that's, the, that's in essence everything that we're going into. Discipline means that you have to be diet conscious. And then physically fit. So that's the thing where it's, it's drawn out that there is a difference between the two. And then when we talk about drug free, we're talking about the fact that people take recreate drugs for or, or, you know, type of drugs for recreational purposes. They're not doing anything to elevate their, their level of consciousness. They are simply taking it because they need to be high in order to uh, to not allow reality to beat them up. If I am so inundated with what's going on around me to where the only time I can function is to be high, that again is no different than going to a drugstore, quote unquote drugstore, and buying any other suppressant. That suppressant is hiding the symptoms. So I am running from the, uh, the real root cause of my problem, and I'm unwilling as a person to be able to correct these things. So therefore, I take something recreational in order to suppress the pain that I'm going through 
the fact that I'm, I'm not willing, able and ready to actually come to the table and make change for myself. So, see, if I'm going to call myself a revolutionary, if I'm going to get out in the community and attempt to do work to try to make change for the better, then I have to recognize what's going on here. Number eight should be able to explain the causes of particular actions, especially concerning the actions of governments and nations. And so from that standpoint, we need to be able to see what's going on around the world and not simply have our head in the sand and think that what happens here in the U.S. is the only thing that matters. Number nine must pose above average auditory, cognitive and critical thinking skills. Again, what we are taught in the way we are taught as a masses of people is not to be able to be critical thinkers, not to be able to come to a conclusion of being able to address liberation, sovereignty or anything that's going to actually make change for the for the better and, and bring about revolution. Obviously, there's always uh, exa uh, 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 alternate examples or alternate uh, ways that people break through the system. You know, there's exceptions to the rule. There's always people that will be able to because of just a natural brilliance or just the path that they they stumble upon will become self awakened. But for the whole masses, that is just not the path. And again. If we're not dealing with what we call direct, synchronized uh, collective action, then having a few people here and a few people there at different points in times is not going to take us where we need to be need to be if we want to address this thing through a generational foundation approach. Number 10 should strive to keep their actions in line with their words. And engage actual facts over opinions. That's really is just another aspect of talking about being a critical thinker. But you also want to make sure that what you say and what you do are one in accord or in harmony and balance with one another. Number 11 must be entirely committed to the people and bonded to the path of struggle and freedom, which goes back to if you're dealing with being willing, able and ready, then number 11 comes natural in that progression. Because we're talking about the way of life of a revolutionary. Number 12 must be able to re, uh, relate revolution in a modern day context and make it applicable to real life situations. We can't be nostalgic. We can't simply deal with things in the past and the legacy. And we can't try to live out through our past. We must come to the table and evaluate things based upon the current trends of oppression the current trends and the current factors of the things that are being successful today. And it also goes back to number six when we say be learned in history, politics, economics, religions, and so forth. Because if we're not learned in that, then we're not going to be able to deal with making something applicable to real life current day, day situations. Because it's going to, everything is going to seem brand new to us. Because we hadn't studied our history. If we hadn't studied our history, then we're not able to deal with what we call pattern recognition. And pattern recognition gives us the ability to be able to go into something from a critical scientific analysis approach. Number 13, must evolve with the times by being a keen observer and learn from the success and failures of past revolutions. We can't hold on to how something was yesterday in terms of winning a specific battle. We must realize that things are fluid. Life is fluid. And so therefore, we must be fluid. Anybody got anything they want to add or any questions about that? And again, if you want a copy of this document, just put your, uh, your email in the chat. But I'm all fuss and dialogue if we got if we uh got anybody that wanna that wanna add to something. Yahuru and Black Power, comrade. I want to just say that. Well, first of all, this is Brother Motherland National State Defense for People's Political Party. I just want to say that I appreciate the knowledge that you're driving up in here tonight. And I 
and breaking it down so where the people will be able to understand exactly no, excuse me proper terminology be able to overstand as well as understand exactly what you're saying and where you're coming from like power like power thank you comrade my offer is basically the slave the uh the uh, path of the slave trade what that had to do with is what we was referred to as the middle package passage of from from the continent of africa through the different Carib uh, caribbean uh uh, islands on to the Americas. So what we're talking about is where when we say that we're, we're talking about realizing and this is one of the ways that they continue to create an inferior what they call an inferiority complex or an inferior, uh, inferior being in terms of domesticating the, pe uh, the African people here in the United States is because when we think black history, we tend to start with slavery. And by us starting with slavery, we automatically put ourselves in a position of being lesser than where we need to be in order to fight a fight that is going to deal with liberation. And uh appreciate you, uh, Brother Psych. Feel free to jump in. Uh, Swahili word for the great disaster or what we call our Holocaust because of millions and millions of, of people dying during the, middle, during the Middle Passage. And so knowing that our history did not start from our enslavement, from being kidnapped and, and, and terrorized and, and brought over to a different land, it gives us a sense of, of, of greater connection to a point in time to where we know we are able to be in control. We know we can be in control of our destiny. We know we can have an intact culture. We can have an intact way of life. We can have an intact um, uh, language. And so you have to be aware of how oppression came about and the aspects of trauma that has been passed on through epigenetics that can, that causes us to operate and think the way we think now to where we are unwilling to really buckle down and deal with freeing ourselves as a people because we're stuck in what we call victimization mode. And so being stuck in victimization mode, you're never going to be able to be in the right space to want to be a revolutionary. You will actually be what Harry Tubman referred to as a runaway slave. Going back to using that as an example, the difference between a liberator and a runaway slave. Keep in mind when, we, when people give credence to what, what went on with that is every single time she freed somebody, she went back and got more. She never once indulged in the life of being in a position to where now I'm not under the uh, under the uh, the the, uh, the uh, aspect of being oppressed, I'm literally gonna go right back in it and get some more people free. The problem with that is most of the people that she liberated were simply runaway slaves, meaning that they didn't in turn have the liberation spirit. And want to also go back and help other people get free, also address aspects of in, the enslavement process and fight for liberation, fight for a change with, within what's going on in the confounds of creating a slave economy. Most folks just wanted to stay away from whatever it was that that hurted them. So they were one away slaves as opposed to being a liberator. When you give your life to the struggle, when you give your life to to the betterment and, and the empowerment and the uplifting of your people, then that is totally different. And so there is a big, distinct, stark difference between being a liberator and a runaway slave. A runaway slave is stuck in their trauma and all they want to do is just be able to live another day outside of the conditions of being oppressed, which from that standpoint, nothing is wrong with obviously wanting not to be in a situation to where you being whipped, you know, uh, raped and everything else that goes along with that. But what we have to realize is that, again, talking about living, the difference between coping and forming an actual solution is if I'm coping with the a, a situation of oppression, then all I'm doing is learning how to better navigate an obstacle course. And this is why we say that. When just because you are good at navigating an obstacle course and, and you don't let oppression slow you down as much 
Meaning as an individual, you have found ways to be able to thrive in an exploitative lifestyle or exploitative environment. And so you all have, have, are able to move around pretty well in that environment. But the conditions have not changed. The conditions are still exploitative. The conditions are still going to oppress everybody else, including you. They're going to keep throwing things out there and you're going to have to keep being able to improve how you run your mouth, improve how you are able to have that out, of course. But if you come at, at, at it, then you remove that obstacle so that are coming in behind you will not have to face that obstacle. They may have different obstacles to face, but they're not going to be constantly compiled and compounded with new obstacles and new concepts and levels of oppression to add on to the ones that they've already continually experiencing anyway. So this is what happens through trauma. We when we're not ready to face op fighting oppression. And all we're doing is, is finding ways to cope with it and navigate oppression, then we're still dealing with a battlefield that is constantly being remined, redeployed with booby traps in, in, in greater and higher levels of booby traps to ensnare and, 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 and affect more and more people for a longer process. And so what I tend to do from that standpoint as an oppressor is I find ways to help you sustain your, op your, your oppressive conditions. And, and that goes into, again, aspects of things that that they give us in order to allow us to be able to deal with it. So these are the di different types of suppressants, whether it be through how the music, the, the music that we listen to, the films that we watch, different things that we do to create these outlets that are allowing us to just let out and unwind some of the effects of oppression, but not ever removing them. Just giving you just enough energy to be able to go right back and and deal with it, so, you know, five, six days a week again, give you a little off time so that you can decompress just so you can have enough energy to go right back out and deal with it again. It's a perpetual cycle. Nothing is changing. You're given just enough free time so that you can recharge and go right back out on and right back out in the field. And that's the whole point. Keep you inundated in that cycle. What was what's called the rat race, but at the same time, keep you mentally lazy so that you never want to actually change those conditions. Let's see where I left off. Uh, I have a question, comrade. Yes, jump in. I have a question. Um, oh, no, your question first. Go ahead. The floor is open. Okay, yeah, well, I'll go for now. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, right, we've determined that the rat race is crushing and it only alleviates enough time for us to recoup just a little bit, just enough energy yep. to go out and be exploited again, right? So what do we yep. do in a manner that is like maintaining revolution, still sustaining yourself enough, you know, that your your basic needs, food, shelter needs are not at risk. So that way you can be a better revolutionary. And then, but by keeping those needs met, you're still engaging in that rat race, which only gives you so much amount of time. Yeah, what what's your take on that? Well, my take on that goes back into first off recognizing number one as as remember when when the Black Panther Party came under attack, it because it was helping the community to realize that we do have the ability to operate and work together to be able to resolve some of the the levels of oppression. In other words, if for instance, we were to learn how to trade amongst each other, work together, see what resources we have, get to know your neighbor and, and, and start in indulging in one another and working with one another as a people, as a collective. We'll find out that 
we may actually not need all these trinkets or may not actually need some of the things that we have been led to believe we need. And therefore, some of our resources will free up in terms of how just saying living paycheck to paycheck. Well, now, if I know that I can go get such and such up the corner or we can pull, pull our money together and operate a certain way, then that means less of our money would have to be utilized to do the same thing. Another case in point, a good example here would be. Think about how the real estate market is designed to where you're taught as as a person to from a family standpoint to basically grow up. Get a good job. Get, get to so where you can get where you can buy a house and then raise a family. And then they get to a point to where they need to immediately move out and then go out yonder and buy their own house and then raise their own family. What happened if two families decided to buy a plot of land? And actually occupy a larger area and then just start building houses within that. If we were to pool our resources together, we can actually accomplish a hell of a lot more than when individuals go into trying to deal with an adventure. You see, so we're taught to divide each other. If we thought about land and utilize land as a in, in a type of environment to where we're buying up plots and we're and we're all moving in and generationally what we're doing is we're saying, hey, instead of sending my children out to just go elsewhere and have to start from scratch. How about building a house on, on the land that we already own? How about just expanding that? How about just raising, doing that? From that standpoint, they're spending a whole lot less money, whole lot less resources and needing a lot less than they would if I make them start from scratch, start from, from ground zero. We have this approach to where we're taught to basically redo everything from one on one. And that's, that's not the way it should be. As long as you keep the people divided, you get you keep the people reduplicating the same resources, the same processes and the same methods instead of combining them. There are so many different examples and ways to where we can combine our resources, which will combine our wealth and which will combine our ability to be able to not have to work so hard and work as hard and be caught up in in the same rut. So but that kind of goes back to changing our dynamic, changing our lifestyle, changing how we view things within the Black Panther Party and the Panther Party. Again, we said it earlier, we have what we call define, develop and defend. That's coupled with what we call three P's, which is perception, how you pursue something and then how you preserve something. So in order in order to deal with definition, we have to have the ability to, to perceive what the true and real definition is that we should be operating from, as opposed to operating from an image that has been projected on me. But in order to do that, I have to be what I have to reach toward being a visionary. So my perception has to change. It's no different than when you talk about somebody that is a drug dealer who's used to making a thousand dollars a week. And all of a sudden you say, dude, why don't you get a, you know, a, 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 a decent job and, and stop poisoning your people where well, they're used to making a thousand dollars a week? What are you going to supply them with to where they have that same level of economics? Now you have to go back to their perception. Number one, most drug dealers from that standpoint probably have a high level of recreational uh, 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 money that they spend. They have a certain lifestyle that they're living that is basically having them inundated in nothing that's being progressive in terms of, you know, truly doing anything in their, with their life. But they're, they're taking in a lot of money and then they're spending a lot of money. So from that standpoint, it goes back into us living what we call beyond our means. Usually, no matter how much money most of us make, we end up spending and acquiring enough things to where whatever bracket of money we make, we in the same bracket of money that we spend. And so therefore, the next year we want to make a little bit more and then we end up spending a little bit more and we keep rising up the ladder, what we call the Joneses. And so the problem with that is that's because the perception of 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 of, of necessity versus wants and desires and the things that are bombarding the society 
are matching the scale at which the, the uh, level of, of economics that you are exposed to. And they they do that intentionally to make sure that the dollar is, is in constant circulation, constant circulation. And so our perspective has to change. Once our perspective has to change, then we will have a, a broader window of availability in terms of really how far we can stretch the money that we make because we're able to deal with this now from more of a collective standpoint than an individual standpoint. So I hope I answered your question without rambling too much. I, so I had a question. Yes. So my question would be referring to the um, <clears throat> knowing outside political, um, what's going outside of the U.S. So um, what I wanted to ask that is if um, the Black Panther Party is keeping an eye on the um, the countries in Africa that has been um, actually like Burkina Faso, Niger, mm -hmm. and Mali, who used to be French colonies, I have right. kicked all um, French out of their countries, and then now Senegal and another island, the French island that they have. But my point is that um, how do you think that would be, you know, all this movement is happening, how is it going to affect the U.S.? Because the U.S. does have colonies. The closest one they have is um, to relationship is um, Nigeria and I on those, the Sahel region. So the point I'm saying is that when Ibrahim Chihori took over uh, Burkina Faso, they tried to kill him about three times this year, yeah. but he's still around. Yeah. But he also has established like their own... Um, mining um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um facility he built yeah. operation farming and all that that within a year's time because his focus um, was that france had troops on the ground the last decade to get rid of like isis and stuff but nothing what they have missed is like ever since they've been that's what you know struggling more because it's like he doesn't understand how uh, countries who have so much resources cannot find yep. the um, ISIS anywhere. So within the year of um, them him taking over, they have eradicated all those um, those areas from region for region of Burkina Faso. So the question is like, how do you think that it's kind of like a dog because all of those France and Brit Britain and America, they all have a legion to keep each other afloat. So to me, that France is losing money. So how is that going to affect the rest of the Western world? So again, kind of going back to one of the things I pointed out in the very beginning about how the job of the CIA is to create destabilization within other nations. When you talk about imperialism, imperialism is is based on being able to exploit. The United States will not be the world power it is, as well as other other a few other world powers, unless they were able to exploit uh, and, and acquire natural resources at 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 very very cheap uh, cheap cost, and ex, you know and take advantage of the peoples of that land whose uh, natural resources they're exploiting. And so the idea here, and, and you can, in fact, uh, you being very familiar with, with, with Haiti, uh, country of how Haiti came into, in, into being, look at it like this. Remember when Haiti won his, his liberation, Haiti had to pay reparations. Now, explain this, people. I'm paying reparations because I freed myself. I'm literally paying you because you are forcing me to pay you for the amount of money that I am not going to be able to make off on off of you on future generations because I am no longer able to exploit you. That is the mindset of the colonizer. How crazy is that, that I am have the audacity to make you pay me reparations because I can no longer enslave you. You see, and because of that. It created an economic crunch on Haiti. To the point to where it, it 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 that kept it unstable. That kept it at a position to where it could not gain and and utilize and and, and come on a, a footing to where the people can actually pro prosper. And so when you talk about colonization as a whole, and you talk about extorting and taking the resources from people, going back to what you was talking about, Burkina Faso. The deal is 
is I realize if if I'm on the right path that there is wealth. And if I redistribute that wealth to the people of, of my land, then we as a country can thrive and, and can actually not be in, in conditions of poverty. Going back to how we started this this uh, this discussion. Remember the three conditions that destroy the black community, poverty, ignorance and oppression. So. The idea here is that all of those are getting addressed. And as those three things get addressed. The colonizer does not want you to recognize in the in the mass of people to recognize how much they have been missing out on what it means to actually be in a position of self-determination. Keep in mind, in the continent of Africa, part of another weapon that is deployed against them is what was called foreign aid. Foreign aid typically is basically when a country, or uh, let's just say a world power, is going to supply this other nation with certain monetary gains and, and, and certain financial gains in order to so, uh, quote unquote, be able to sustain itself. But what it's doing is it's basically aligning the pockets of people that they have put in positions of power, which ends up creating corrupt regimes, which the resources never actually make it in terms of the proper distribution to the masses of people. But not only that, what happens is what their country is really doing is creating what a false sense of obligation. I am actually giving you this aid so that I can get something in exchange. What they usually get in exchange is some type of corporation that's able to go in and extract natural resources of the land. OK, so you let us set up shop and we'll give you money. We'll help you this way. What they're doing at that point is they're creating what we call a domesticated being, a domesticated operation. It's no different than realizing when we say domesticated is this. When I get you dependent upon me to feed you, dependent upon me for survival, then now everything that that you become is based upon you continually getting that handout. I've created a codependency. Creating a codependency means that now you're unable to be self-sufficient. You are unable to be able to actually uh, uh, develop and, and deal with the world the way it is. Deal with your, your own actual resources, you see. and so. Creating codependency is part of the trap. In the 48 Laws of Power, it talks about despising the free lunch because there is really no such thing. They always want something. And, when, and by them wanting something, know that it's going to benefit them, them, them more than it is you. And so for everything that they have to gain, there's going to be something that is going to be more so destroyed and hurt you further and more so in the end. So we have to be able to identify the weapons of exploitation, the weapons of of, 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 of supremacy and the weapons of, uh, of, of imperialism. And by the African nations finally kicking out the, the colonizers and the oppressors, know that the idea here is that they're not going to go down without a fight. They're going to continue to try to find ways to have people come in from within your own nation and try to fight you and, and advance rebels to try to come up and, and attack. Keep, remember that the CIA trains, trains on, on, on foreign soil terrorist groups to actually operate and commit the acts that they want so that they can destabilize the country and then go back in and put politicians back in positions of power that they that that would do their bidding. But they will literally go out and find people that are suffering from high levels of, 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 of poverty that are just willing to want to have something better. And don't care that what they're doing is actually uh, uh, furthering the cause of the colonization, furthering the cause of the oppressor. But you can always find some some dummies. And so from that standpoint, you arm them with weapons and tools and technologies that they can go in and be able to fight that war and fight for you. And so that's all we're dealing with. So, yes, the Black Panther Party does recognize that, which is goes into why when we talk about our, our, our 10 point platform. We are we are gaining our freedom and we are practicing processes of self-determination as a people. We're putting ourselves in position of kinetic operation. And so. But the masses need to wake up the masses of our people here in the United States. And we need to be able to form that proper, true connection and bridge with uh, our comrades 
on 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 the continent, our comrades in other other parts of the uh, diaspora. So thank you for that, comrade. Let me keep going on to the next slide here. Aimless energy serves no targeted purpose. Now let's 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 take that in as we talk about this uh, next section here and, and, and talk about energy. Energy is uh, derived from two sources, natural and social. The reason why it's important to define and understand these two types of energies is because one comes from within and the other comes from the bonding with your comrades. And so this is getting you in the proper mind state to be able to deal with collective operations and collective work because we've been stripped of that reality. So we have what we call natural energy that comes from within. Energy is being uh, dispensed at all times. It's either constructive or destructive. Remember that. That depends on the type of seeds that are planted and the type of lives we live. We must at all times be aware of the energy we're putting out. The essence of social energy derives from collective cooperation of a group. Man gains power as he works uh, cooperatively with others on common goals, which kind of goes back to the question Comrade Coyote was asking. Once we start identifying and seeing the power of the collective of the of the collective, then that does free up more resources that does give us more access to being able to not have to grind and deal with the, the rat race the way we do. And with that, I just thought I'd, it'd be a good time to throw up two people that most folks are probably not familiar with. Grandmaster uh, uh, Hati Kalinde. Uh, Kalinde actually uh, made a transition a few years ago and supposedly co uh, coronavirus took him out. But he was the founder of Tamarian African Martial, Martial Science, which is referred to as Muntu Science as opposed to saying Martial. And we say Muntu from an African di tradition because we identify with aspects of 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 our culture as opposed to Mars or, or Marshall, which is which which is Greek culture from that standpoint. And, and and we know that when we talk about martial science and combat systems, that it started in Africa, not in Greece. Now, Professor Ronald Duncan was actually the father of American ninjutsu. And most people are not familiar with it being a black man that actually introduced that to the continent of Af of, of I mean uh, uh, in the United States that helped brought brought that about. So dealing with natural energy and with energy science period, I just thought it'd be a good idea to throw those two facts on the table. Now energy extends in three forms. What we call potential energy deals with people who have no knowledge of self, the struggle, and whom play a role in destruction of our community. So they just have that potential. Now kinetic is where where we talk uh within the black within the Black Panther Party. Beginning begins the training of a new mindset. Energy is being expanded, learning about the struggle and participating in finding solutions to the social challenges we face. Constantly working towards our goals of liberation and self-determination is the best example of having kinetic energy. Now, dissipated energy is rightly guided and on a course for change. This energy is in the raging fire that continually burns and sparks smaller, smaller fires. This energy reflects the passing forward of learned skills set as foundational power. So what we're saying from that standpoint is we have to realize the trifactor of how energy exists. The idea here is, is to suppress the awareness of the masses so that most people simply sit in their potential. But that potential can be powerful. And when it's powerful, when it's ignited, then that's when that kinetic jumps in and turns on. And as that kinetic turns on, then we're faced with a newfound love for, for, for our people. And so therefore we want to build a foundation and through that foundation, now we're able to dissipate the energy. And so I just decided also to make sure to throw the law of conservation up here. So you, so we get that and see the deal is 
is we're taught to think outside of natural law. We're taught to not be able to realize and see things for what they really they truly are, especially when when people are exposed to high levels of Hollywood and high levels of, of virtual reality to where you have these things that really w- would not work in a, in a real life situation. But because we're constantly inundated with false realities, these false realities create a, 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 a disassociation with being able to really deal with problems on true terms. And so therefore we end up living a dysfunctional lifestyle and through that dysfunctionality. Now the best approach that we have is to inundate ourselves in recreational levels of of suppression. So we're getting close to being able to wrap this up. So in regards to the black will of family, uh, a section called books of chambers, the book chambers, the book chambers is basically the books that must be purchased by each regime and read by each comrade. So this is basically a book list of books that members of the black gorilla family uh, had to study. And again, th- th- this is something I, I did pull off the internet. So I'm pretty sure it's been updated, but just to give y'all an idea. For those that may have jumped on or forgot, if you want a copy of this document, then just shoot your email in the chat. And then you can go through that. All right. So this is one of the the points of contention we do have to talk about. Briefly, though. At the top here, we must take our destiny. We must take our destiny back in our own hands. We must dig into our past in order to make the present and and future conditions better. We have to emulate the paths of the paths of our ancestors. And we have to uh, represent and project the excellence of our own natural abilities. And the key word there is our natural abilities. On August the 22nd, now remember, uh, Joyce Jackson was killed on August the 21st. Huey was killed on August the 22nd, 1989. In a drug deal uh, related incident by a member of the Black Gorilla family named Tyrone Robinson. Now this is obviously what we're talking about when the black gorilla family ended up being on the levels of attack, basically ended up losing the, the, the core principles in terms of the younger generations throughout the prison, lo- use, losing the core principles of what George Jackson uh, and, and others helped found, founded the organization on. And it became something different. So he was found, uh, uh, Tyrone Robinson was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 32 years. Robinson served 18 years in Alameda County before being transferred uh, to a different state prison in 2019, I'm sorry, 2009, and from there wrote a note claiming his innocence and legal counsel. Allegedly, <clears throat> while in prison, he ended up stabbing and killing another inmate in October the 11th, 2013. And then that ended up getting him additional charges. And 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 at that point, he's facing uh, the death uh, was facing the death penalty. But in 20 uh, death penalty in, in 2023, he applied for parole, but was denied for an additional five years. And he's currently being held in California State Prison in Sacramento. And his next parole hearing is scheduled for 2020, uh, 2028. But the irony of the fact that <clears throat> the very organization that George Jackson uh, helped found it is the same organization that basically was the prison wing of the Black Panther Party. But even going further back, because this is one thing you have to look at. Remember, if the Black Gorilla family was established in 1966 and the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was established in 1966, one of the unknown aspects in terms of influence that also was taking place with 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 uh, George Jackson was not just simply the Black Panther Party, but it, what it was also was with the Revolutionary Action Movement. And so the Revolutionary Action Movement played a key a key role in terms of of the influence of the Black Guerrilla family as well. And that's something that is, has not most not been talked about much. 
as well as another little uh, little known fact within the ranks of the black black gorilla family is um, Bunchy Carter's brother ended up being one of the uh, the high generals of the black gorilla family. And this here is just a list of, of books that was found in George Jackson's uh, cell after he was uh, assassinated. So from that standpoint, you can just kind of get a, a glimpse, an idea of the different books that 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 he was studying. And, and from that standpoint, help you be able to see the level of discipline necessary and the type of things that we need to study when we talk about a revolutionary way of life. So it's just four pages of that showing the different books he had in there. So again, if you want to copy that document. Now, here in San Diego, for those of you all in San Diego, we're going to be doing a Black August Forum this Saturday at the uh, Logan Heights Library from 2 to 4.30. So we're inviting the community, the public to come out and participate in and build with us on 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 that event. So that's going to be again. That's this Saturday, and it's a, a flyer here on that from two to four thirty. So come join us. And then the following weekend, we're going to be uh, there's going to be a a uh, commemorating Black August film screening showing the movie Black August, and that's going to be at the Malcolm X Library next Saturday from two to four. So come out and and learn more about that, and and let's uh watch the movie and then have some, some nice discussion on it.